Phyllis is VP of Strategic and Regulatory Affairs uh, at Atlantium Technologies, and I particularly want to note the Atlantium motto, more disinfection, less power. Phyllis? Hi, uh, I'm Phyllis Posey, and I'm going to find my presentation somehow. Let's see if we can do that. One of the things when you're in a high tech, you're supposed to know a little bit about the low tech too. My name is Phyllis Posey and I'm Vice President of Strategic and Regulatory Affairs at Atlantium Technologies. And Asaf and Maytal are going to escape after giving you all the issues and the problems. Um, but they're not going to stay for the solutions, you all. And I think that Atlantium Technologies, uh, I hope you'll feel that after a couple of minutes you'll understand that it's just a question of how you look at it. Atlantium is a company that has become the global leader in UV disinfection technology because we attain reliable disinfection where it was never able to be attained before without chemicals. Atlantium is, there we go, let's see if we can get this to work. Hmm. I think we'll just do, this. There we go. There we go. Wait, we're going to get it. Atlantium is where the brand counts. When the brand counts, Atlantium is called in. We are available and we work in many different foods and beverage, biopharma, aquaculture. In fact, uh, in the world today, they say the fish vote for Atlantium. Because if you have a million bottles and you have one microbe in one of those bottles, somebody may get sick. But if you have a million fish, and one fish gets sick, that fish kisses its brothers, uncles, aunts, and cousins, and it's a smelly business. <laughs> we are extremely active in municipal water with lots of successes I want to tell you about, as well as um, EDCs, all kinds of ways of treating water to make water safe. What we've done is we've changed the paradigm about how to use and how to make UV technology. The traditional technology had a lamp inside water. It was fraught with all kinds of maintenance issues because the scaling on the lamps, the uh, electrical, uh, call them disruptive technologies that electrocuted lots of folks, all of those things were part of what people thought about UV. And in fact, in general, folks said, well, UV, just turn it on. If the light's on, it's probably working because the sun works. So this must work too. And it was never a technology that was considered measurable or really that people could measure. And what we did is with patented hydro-optic engineering, we've optimized UV efficiency and we've made it a measurable and accountable technology. And that's the paradigm shift. What we've done is we've taken you know, one of those ideas that was out there. Um, as Maytel said, in, in Israel, we think of water as our oil, except it's better because we can drink it, okay? And when people think about anything, they think about their day, they think about water. And so lots of people from optics, physics, and telecommunications who thought about fiber optics, and as you well know, fiber optics is a thin fiber quartz tube that, puts in, that you put in energy, and it kind of wanders back and forth and back and forth because of an air block that's surrounding the quartz tube and uh, takes advantage of the physical principle called total internal reflection. Well, we said, hey, if you can do that for sound, and that's how many of you talk over long distances, why can't you do it for water? Well, it's, it's fairly simple. How would you get the water in the tubes and all? Well, so we said, instead of having those thin, tiny little quartz tubes, we are going to have a quartz fiber optic water pipe. And so instead of making a stainless steel like the traditional with the lamp in the middle of the water, we said, let's take a quartz fiber optic, make a quartz fiber optic water pipe, put an air block around it, put stainless steel to protect the air block, right? Because the air needs to be protected. And then we're going to inject that UV for disinfection, block off the disinfection chamber, and kill everything inside. And so, what we have done is taken that concept and developed it further because the traditional low pressure technology was founded on the basis that one size kills all. 
It was called the germicidal wavelength, and they said it was 254. Well, that was fine because in 1914, when UV disinfection was first discovered, people knew that UV would kill and disable microbes, um, but they expected it to do it all at once. Now, just look around the room. Would one punch get everybody? One punch would get me, but probably not you. So what we said is, wait, instead of having one wavelength, let's have lots and lots of wavelengths. Let's take a whole bunch of weapons, and with those weapons together, we will do total disinfection of water. And so although the EPA insisted in their 2006 regulations that it was impossible to kill viruses um, with UV, we said, hey, impossible, you know, if you've been to Israel, you know, impossible is where Israelis start, okay? And if it's impossible, maybe we can do it, and we have. And in fact, with uh, medium pressure UV light, we're able to disinfect adenovirus, pseudomonas, which is a chemical, chemically dis, a chemical, uh, a chemically resistant microbe that is responsible for most biofilms. Cryptosporidium and Giardia, which are part of the EPA wa drinking water rules, as well as algae, which uh, does not, is not interested in low pressure UV, but is kind of scared of us. But the main thing we've done is we've said, okay, if you're going to do this and you can't measure it and you can't control it, you haven't done it. Because how can you use a technology for drinking water for those kinds of applications that really make a difference if you can't measure it and control it. And so what we did is we mixed that fiber optic technology with software technology and designed a software interface that not only measures exactly the UV that's out there, but controls it and documents when it's working and when it's not. And then we said, okay, it's all fine and good to say, hey, this is good meeting pressure technology, we can measure it, all this good stuff. But when you think about it, Think about effectiveness. Everybody says the bell curve, right? Some are a little low, some are in the middle, and if you've got the average, then you're okay. And that was the traditional perspective of the, of the industry. Well, we said, hey, wait a second. If you've got an average, that means some are very dead and some are having babies in your bathwater. Hmm, not a very good idea. So what we said is what you really need is a uniform dose distribution. You need to make sure that rather than having to put in a lot of energy close to that bulb in the middle of the water in order to get the kill or the, dis the inactivation far farther away, we said, no, what you really need is a totally uniform dose distribution. And then we said, hey, if you can't prove it, it ain't there. And so with NASA, um, HydroQual, the uh, H now HDR engineers in Purdue University, they actually measured dose distribution in three um, UV units, ours and two other competitors. And the competitors were a difference of about 28% between what they thought was the dose, what they thought was the minimum dose, turned out to be the minimum dose, and what the dose they really gave, and ours was 2%. Now, with Atlantium, what you see is what you get. The water receives at least the minimum validated reduction equivalent dose and not an average dose. And we tell you what it is, and then we say, okay, how do we take that to the market? And what we decided is the only way to take it to the market is to accomplish what the EPA said was impossible. So we went to the EPA and we said, hey, you guys have said in your regulations that this can't be done. What if we do it? And they said, oh, no, no, you can't do it. There's no way. And so we said, mm, are you sure? And we went to some of the leading scientists and challenged them to think about things differently. And the reason the EPA said that you couldn't do it is because the traditional way of proving these things and validating these things is through a surrogate, right? You're not gonna take all those germs and, and kind of validate them. You use a surrogate, and that surrogate is sort of your, in Hebrew they call it the bimkom. It's the, the representative thing that tells you that this unit is working. But we said, hmm, how about if, you, if you're saying you want to target adenovirus, how about if you grow up adenovirus and you test it full scale with adenovirus? Okay, you want four logs of adenovirus, put in four logs of adenovirus, and test it full scale. And everybody said, no, 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 that can't be done. And of course, we did it. And the first time we did it, we went back to the EPA and we said, hey, we did it. And they said, 
one point does not make a line. And then we went back, and it's true, that's right, it's true. And then the next time we went back to the EPA, we did it again. In fact, uh, with Akram Tamimi, a brilliant Palestinian uh, virologist who works at the University of Arizona. Um, and um, we did it again, and then they said, you've been praying. <laughs> and so we've just done it again. And so we now have EPA approval for four log adenovirus. Uh, we have, uh, they've uh, given us the, what's called the ETV, the Emerging uh, Technology Verification. Um, we actually are in quite a few systems. Uh, we've just, uh, this last week, actually uh, on Friday, we were informed by the state of New Jersey, Department of Environmental Protection, that they will allow uh, drinking water suppliers in New Jersey to use our unit without chlorine as the disinfectant. Um, we are in New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, and uh, please God, tonight if I, my flight goes out, tomorrow we'll be in Montana. <laughs> um, our theme has been big system technology for small systems. The challenge in the U.S. with U.S. infrastructure is that big systems can afford all of the scientific piloting and all of the conversations and all the engineering and all the talk, but the small systems can't. And today, they're held to, to some extent, the same, what I call the food chain. It's the same process by which to get approval for technology. So if you're in New York, you can do Cat Dell, and that's what they do. Today, New York disinfects two billion gallons a day with UV technology. Not ours, but with UV technology. But they could afford all of the piloting, the eight years of design, the 12 years of planning, et cetera, et cetera. But the <coughs> Mohawk New York, that has 300 uh, folks, they can't afford that. Okay. And people cannot, companies and innovators can't necessarily afford to sell just to the Mohawks because you can't sell it to Mohawk for $18 billion. They don't have it. Okay. And we were particularly lucky, and here when uh, um, Asaf talks about venture capitalists, what he needs to understand is that there are venture idealists. There are the people who are committed to making things better. And we are lucky enough to be founded by um, such a person, Morris Kahn, who when he uh, got his billion dollars at the end of the uh, internet bubble and he sold his companies, he said, I want to create environmentally positive technologies here in Israel. Um, and he has funded this because that's what he wants. And in fact, his son has been our CEO and is, our, is my boss today and is our CEO and has been our CEO for four years now because we are looking to create big system technology for small systems, and thank God, successfully. This is uh, last week where the um, giving the ETV symbol to one of our municipal suppliers, uh, to the uh, person who is the health department, the local health department regulator, and the head of the municipal com uh, commission for the town of Mohawk. It's kind of a little bit interesting in the sense that we did we started with Mohawk in 2008. And in July this past year, they flooded. And the machine that they had been using to get four log virus disinfection and to provide safe water for their uh, population um, died because it was underwater for three days. And they called us and they said to us, Phyllis, what should we do? Can we, you know, we're on boiled water, what do we do? And we put a clock in my office and in eight days, we started the manufacturing process. We had people working all night and we got Mohawk back with water. We brought a machine, we created a machine, we created, we manufactured a machine to their specifications. We got it to Mohawk, we had our folks there installing it, and it was originally supposed to come on Saturday, but the guy who was the head of maintenance was getting married on Saturday. He said, Phyllis, I'll move the wedding. I said, nope, we'll move the reactor. And we got it there, and they had fresh water uh, for his wedding. Mohawk gets the EPA ETV, and uh, this is just hot off the press, February 28th, um, our New Jersey authorization as well. No, uh, now New Jersey approves Atlantean instead of chlorine. Mm. And not only in the US. Um, in Rwanda, we're making river water safe. Um, it's a container, um, and it provides drinking water to a population of uh, 3,000 folks. 
not only drinking water. Davis Dam, everybody kind of knows what Davis Dam is, right? Well, Davis Dam suffers from what they call invasive species. Those are the little mussels that come and get on the filters and get on the turbines and create a significant problem with uh, energy conservation and energy. And so Davis Dam asked us to come there and they said it couldn't be done because how can you deal with that level of invasive species? What would they do is they have a filter to take the big guys, but they've never been able to um, disinactivate the little guys. And you can see here that without the Atlantean system, it's very clear that those mussels are growing. With the Atlantean system, it's about 98 to 99% less. Um, okay? Um, we have, uh, in Brazil, the pictures tell the story. That's without Atlantium, and that's with Atlantium. That's golden mussels, uh, hydrozoa, uh, after Atlantium treatment. 28 days in the water with Atlantium and without Atlantium. And Atlantium controls macrofouling. We control microfouling uh, because of our effectiveness with Pseudomonas and chemically resistant um, microbes. You can look at the difference between membranes that have been treated uh, that are looking at UV water versus membranes that have water that has no UV treatment. Think about that from a major impact on critical cooling and heat transfer applications. And right now we're working in a nuclear power plant where the big intakes are big, but the heating cables are small. And this is just a recently got this, you can see that without the Atlantium system, macrofouling and the biofouling is significant. With the Atlantium system, it's not. So our integrated software does the work for you. It's optimized for local water conditions, easy maintenance with very short bulbs, um, and then always service with a smile, because if you can't actually help people create safe water, you haven't done much. So. Safe water all the time. Appreciate your help. Phyllis, thank you so much. One of the nice things about hearing your talk and, and us talk uh, is, is uh, how you are able to explain these complicated uh, water technologies to us in layman's terms. So um, you are uh, you're standing there impatiently because I know that all of you are running off to the World Bank. Will you take uh, one or two very short questions? We have a microphone. Albert Shea, AU Environmental Science. I'm trying to understand your technology. It looks like what you're doing is you're bouncing UV around inside a reaction chamber. But you said uh, on that slide that you had a quartz tube, which would be UV transparent. On another slide, it looked like you had a metal tube. Is that correct? No, but I'll explain. Fiber optic is a quartz tube, and you're right. And you're UV introducing... goes through the fiber optic quartz but it's bounced back by the air block back into the water. And the metal makes sure that nothing, that the air block doesn't move. So the metal tube never sees water, right? It only provides the container, the stainless steel provides the container for the fiber optic uh, quartz pipe that we bounce the UV into the fiber optic quartz pipe the UV escapes, so to speak, through the quartz, but because of total internal reflection, the air block puts it right back into the fiber optic channel so that instead of a light path having this much space to kill a microbe or to inactivate a microbe, it has, whoops, so, that much. Yeah. Phyllis, I, once, again, once again, I thank you. Um,